Hi, in this video we will talk about the King's Indian type 2 structure, played from White's perspective. This pawn structure is characterized by the central pawns on c4, d5 and e4, against Black's pawns on c5, d6 and e5. The key idea from Black's perspective is that Black can actually pursue the plan with a f7, f5 to hit the base of the pawn chain, while White can't hit the d6 pawn so easily. Now instead of that, White has two main plans to pursue in this position. The most common one is to play b2, b4 in order to attack the c5 pawn and create some kind of queenside pressure. This isn't always easy, but this is the standard plan. And then the second plan, which is a little bit less common, is to play on the king side with f2, f4. Now, next we will see some examples for both ideas. So, okay, let's start with our first example. This game will illustrate the power of Black's b2, b4 break. Black shows a relatively unusual opening system, perhaps he was trying to avoid specific opening preparation, but the position he obtained uh, was a little bit odd, as we will see now. Okay, so, you know, the opening went a little bit odd, but still White is kind of playing in a reasonable way, but now White decided that he was ready to define the situation in the center by playing d5. And after c5, we have reached the structure of interest. White has a favorable version of it so far, since, well, I mean, the queen is not very well placed, and especially, black is not particularly well prepared to play this f5 plan, which is kind of the main thing that he should be doing here. Now, white began by playing a3, uh, preparing the standard break, which is b2, b4. And now black played a6. And this is probably a move that many players play kind of out of instinct, without even thinking very much about it. You know, the idea of having to deal with this knight coming to b5 at any time might be unpleasant to many. But, you know, perhaps also some people like to create the possibility of playing b5 at some point. But I just want to make it very clear that this move just doesn't add anything good to the position. And the main thing is that it weakens the b6 square, which is something that we will see later. And when you analyze this game a little bit further, you will see just how relevant this move is. So this is actually a pretty serious positional concession. Now the game continued with bishop e3, knight f8, and now b4. Now white has the possibility to trade on c5, after which the d5 pawn would actually become a lot stronger. And then of course, when we put a rook on b1, we can put some pressure on the b file, which would be very nice for white. So now black has to make a decision what to do about the c5 pawn. I hope it is clear that trading on b4 can only favor white in this position. Now he has a much stronger control of the center and the possibility of playing c4, c5 break should be very scary for black. Now the game might continue with something like bishop d7 because, I mean, we definitely want to avoid this idea of knight a4, knight b6. And, uh, well, then white can just continue with queen d3, bring the rook. The idea of c4, c5 is always present, so maybe black will try b6 to neutralize it a little bit. But then after rook a3, White could double uh, rooks on the a file and then press against the a6 pawn, which would be a little bit unpleasant. I mean, so in this position, we can see that white is in complete control of the game. It's actually pretty difficult for black to create any meaningful counterplay. Now, going back just a few moves. After white played b4, black decided to play b6, which makes a lot of sense. The idea is that if white decides to take on c5, then black will just take with the pawn. So, I mean, white can do this, but it makes a little bit more sense to build some pressure first. So white continued with rook b1, bishop d7, okay, now we want to double rooks, so rook e2 makes sense. And uh, something interesting to notice is that right now, the pawn on c4 is weak. It's temporarily without defense. But in case of pawn takes b4, you know, black might be thinking about attacking this pawn on c4, but actually white has the strong move rook takes b4. Now, typically, taking with the rook on b4 wouldn't be so great, uh, because then a knight can come to d7 and then c5, which is not very pleasant. The problem here for black is that after he played a6, suddenly the b6 pawn is just so weak. And in fact, in this position, it can't be defended. I mean, if you defend it with the rook, I'll just bring my other rook and then even my queen. It's clear that this pawn on b6 is falling. So you see, this is just one simple example for why playing this a6 earlier in the game was not such a great idea. Going back to the game, after rook e2, black decided to play knight g6, so we double rooks, and uh, now queen b3. Now, white is threatening to play b takes c5, so the idea is 
that black will have to figure out how to deal with this problem on c5. For example, if he decided to make a waiting move like bishop c8, then after b takes, he has to choose between two unpleasant scenarios. One of them could be to take on c5 with the b pawn, and then I take on b8, and then I take, and actually this position should be lost. White doesn't have any easy targets, like there are no holes in his position, so the queen can't really do that much. And in that case, two rooks should just be able to beat a queen, in the long run at least, because, you know, the two rooks tend to be stronger if the position is stable to begin with. Now, going back a little bit, the other possibility was after b takes c5 to take with the d pawn. And uh, this makes the d5 pawn very strong, it also makes the b6 pawn a little bit vulnerable. And now white could continue with a very nice move, a4. The idea is to play a5 to break. Black could push, but then the b5 square will be very weak, which is not pleasant. So then maybe the game could continue with something like rook d7, queen a3, knight d7, and now a5. And then now white can just rearrange pieces nicely. For example, he could play knight e2, knight g3, and then bishop d2. And then eventually he'll just play rook a1, take on a5, and then, you know, black's position is just very unpleasant. There are so many weak pawns, like a6, c5. You know, maybe even the e5 pawn might be weak in some situations. So going back. So after queen b3, then black is in a difficult situation. And uh, so he decided that it was time to just fight back and by playing b5. b5 was probably in his mind when he decided to play a6. It's kind of a common idea to think that this position might give him a fighting chance. But it doesn't really. And we will see why. So now in this position, well, white has to be a little bit careful too. If he wanted to just rush to take a pawn, for example, pawn takes c5, then take on b5, and then take, well, I mean, this is not particularly good. It's, a, it's actually pretty bad because then the pawn on e4 is lost and then black gets the pawn back. And, but the more important thing is that white lost control of the center and the game, right? We don't want to allow this. But instead, white can just make a nice preparation move like queen c2. This is what happened in the game. And now we are kind of building some more protection for the e4 pawn. And now next move, we can just decide the tension in the queen side by taking both pawns and winning something. Now, some possibilities. For example, if black decided to take on c4, then white is actually nearly winning after pawn takes c5. So for example, the game could continue with pawn take, pawn take, knight d2. The idea is to take on c4. And we have a huge positional advantage because, well, the d5 pawn is very strong, c5 pawn is very weak, the knight is gonna be super strong. You know, black doesn't have a lot to play for. Now, let's just see how the game might develop. It could be knight e8, take on c4, then maybe place a knight on b6. And then actually material is just falling. And here, I mean, white has many winning options, but I mean, the most obvious is to just take the pawn. So it's a pawn up, still a lot of initiative in favor. This is a very easy win. So going back several moves. After queen c2, black decided to take on b4, and then white took. So after rook takes b4, black maybe could have played b takes e4. And then after knight d2, white will continue with knight takes e4. And uh, as you may recall, I mean, here there is quite a bit of similarity with the previous couple of videos where we were studying the king's kingdom type 1 structure. Well, what you see here is an open queen side, and then you have a d5 pawn against a d6 pawn. d5 pawn is strong, it creates a nice outpost on the c6 square. Meanwhile, the pawn on d6 is a little bit vulnerable, and then white has some additional space. All of these little factors actually make it very hard for black to survive. Now, just to see a simple variation, the game could continue with rook takes before, rook takes, then take on c4. And now, white has two things coming up. Queen a2 and maybe knight b6. Both of them will make the a6 pawn particularly vulnerable. Right? So, this actually becomes a very serious target. And uh, black is borderline losing here. So, maybe the game could continue with bishop d8, queen a2. Now, we would like to take on d6, but right, right now our knight on c3 is hanging, so maybe we play a preparation move like queen a3, black must defend d6, and then we play knight b6. And now the a6 pawn is lost, and uh, therefore the game is lost. The rest should be relatively easy to finish up. So going back several moves. So when we look at this position, after rook takes before, we start to notice that actually black is in serious trouble. 
in spite of the position looking relatively symmetric. I mean, just the, the fact that when we look at these two bishops on f1 and e3 making pressure along consecutive diagonals, it just makes it hard for black to do anything concrete other than just wait passively and perhaps lose a pawn on a6. So now black decided to play knight f4, which is something he had kind of been aiming for for a while when he played knight d7, knight f8, knight g6, knight f4. It doesn't really do much, unfortunately. So after taking on b5 and queen b3, the b5 pawn is just lost and therefore the game is lost for black. And this is not surprising at all. This is kind of a standard outcome in these type of positions. To summarize what happened here, I mean, black played this a6 move, which was a little bit irresponsible. Then white just continued with some natural expansion moves like before and then double rooks. And then this kind of direct confrontation in the queen side ended up being favorable for white. Not very surprising. Now black could have tried to hold the pawn by playing queen a5, but then after a4, the pin on the b file makes the position actually winning for white. Instead in the game black played rook c8 and then after knight takes b5, I mean the game got a little bit complicated later on but white has a full pawn up for no compensation. So at this point we could say that we have obtained the message of this game which was to understand how powerful this b2 b4 break can be and in particular to also see how unnecessary and even detrimental this uh, a7 a6 move is. So moving on in the next example, we will see an example of uh, white's f2, f4 break. So the game started in a relatively standard way. In my book, in fact, Chess Structures, there is a very similar example, which starts in almost the same way. Now, this is kind of a relatively common variation. And now you can see that white has set up his pieces in a completely different way. Right? Compared to the previous game, I mean, the bishop is on g2, the knight is on e2 instead of the previous combination, which was actually a knight on f3 and a bishop on f1. This kind of changes the nature of the game a little bit. This plan with a uh, h3 and b4 could still work, but here we are a lot better set up for an f2, f4 break. So, actually, after seeing the previous game, and uh, perhaps also after knowing how this game might develop, we might consider something like d6, right, instead of f5. Let's first see what happened in the game. It was f5. So then white decided to play f4. And we could say that already his plan looks successful because the central break has been achieved in a moment where every piece is active. You see all of my minor pieces are there and even my rooks are very well positioned. Now, well, many things that black could, could attempt here. In case of pawn takes e4, for example, then after pawn takes e5, there is a threat of playing e6, which practically forces black to take back. And then after knight takes e4, you know, black is already lost, essentially. I mean, if you look at the pawn structure, I mean, you can see that this d5 pawn is very strong, e5 pawn is very weak, c5 pawn is a little bit vulnerable as well. The game might continue something like b6, then d6, take the bishop, and well, the rook is hanging. It's that simple. Another variation might go with knight f5, in which case I can just take on c5. And uh, this pin actually does nothing to me because I can just play uh, b4. The game is over. Going back a few moves, this capture on e4 doesn't really bring anything good. Instead, black could have tried something like knight f6, then trade, and here b3. So we are kind of holding the position for now. If black decided to just take on e4, then well, I could maybe play g4 to take away this f5 square and then take on e4 with a very pleasant position. Instead, black could attempt something like knight g e8 in this position, hoping to reach d6. And this actually looks pretty nice at first. But then, well, white can play something like king h2 to give some extra protection to the g3 pawn. The reason for that is that if we go for knight c1 right away, then maybe knight h5 can be unpleasant. So we play king h2, and then maybe rook b8, knight c1, b6. The idea was to play b6. We played rook b8 first to get out of this powerful diagonal. But then you see black is ready to play knight d6, but it's just not soon enough. Now white can just play knight d3, and uh, we are attacking the e5 pawn very strongly. After bishop d6, we can just play bishop h6, take on f5, and take on e5. 
wipe this upon up and the game is essentially over. Now going back several moves. So just a couple of sample variations already show us that black is in a little bit of trouble. In this position he actually decided to play bishop f6 to hold the center but then we take and you see this bishop on e5 is actually pretty good. Put some pressure on this diagonal it also makes sure that the d6 pawn is not too weak. So white has a simple response bishop f4. So after bishop f4 we get to trade a very important defender and now black's position is starting to look pretty risky. So for example if he had decided to play something like knight f6 normal developing move then we can just take and now it's in the important moment we get to play g4. So the bishop has to go back and then we can play knight d6. And here black will be completely lost because well we will create a pass pawn on e6 and uh, this pass pawn will actually be decisive. Right now there is a threat of playing e7. The problem is that when black plays queen e7 to try to stop it we can just play g5, knight to d5 and then e7 which is just obviously winning. I mean it, it might take a little bit of work but essentially this should be a pretty easy position for white to impose because the queen is trapped. So going back a few moves. So in this position black decided to play g5 instead and now knight d3. Now white has a potential threat of playing e5 which is very unpleasant positionally speaking. It always revolves around the idea of making this d5 pawn so strong. So then pawn takes, knight takes, g5 pawn is hanging so we play h6 and then we take on f8 and play g4. Now something interesting to see here is that white has actually many options to win. So for example queen c3 is a very important idea and the idea is that after pretty much anything that black does we have a very concrete winning sequence. For example bishop d7 I can just play rook f1 take on d6 and then rook f7 which is winning. Another possibility maybe is to play queen e7 rook f1 king h7 and now take again and rook f7. Now again the threat is to checkmate on g7 but then when you play queen g6 I have bishop e4 which is just winning. So going back a few moves in the game white decided to just play g4 bishop d7 and now white just managed to create a new threat by playing b4 which creates a new front of attack and then well I mean black can't take because we can just take with the queen and then at least one pawn is falling probably the d6 d7 pawn probably d6 is more important going back a couple moves after b4 black can play b6 then take take and now you see the game got a little bit complicated but white could have finished the game very nicely by just playing rook f1 queen e7 and then just take on c5 and now black has a very sad choice he could go for d takes e5 in which case i will play d6 i'm attacking the rook so black can go for queen e8 take take knight e5 and now there are many threats. One of them is to take on d7, but actually there is something even worse, which is after bishop e6, I can just play check, check, and queen d3. And the queen is coming to h7, which ends the game immediately. So going back a couple moves. After knight takes e5, we said that pawn take was not very nice. So what about rook c8? Well, we take and play c5. Now, c6 is a deadly threat, so we have to stop it. But then when the knight comes to e5 and then goes to f7 then queen c2 which decides the game immediately. Now going back a few moves I mean maybe we left out some variations let me just show you one of them. Something that we skipped was maybe instead of bishop d7 there was something else. So just to see some other variation to illustrate the vulnerability in black's position. Black could have tried knight e8 just to give some extra protection to the d6 pawn but then after queen c3, white is winning material by force. You see, every tactic seems to work here, and we will discuss a little bit of why. But so, for example, if black played king h7, then I could take bishop b4 and mate. Another possibility would be, you see, after queen c3, maybe queen g7, then I can just take, take, and take on c5, and the game is over. So, why is it that all of this works? Going back to the almost initial position here after f4, the key idea is that you see this spatial advantage for white allows him to control some very important squares. 
For example, here we can see that white in many variations manages to decide the game by controlling this e6 square, right? So a knight is coming to f4 and then e6. That really makes a difference. And then again, we always have this recurring idea of the comparison between a very powerful pawn on d5 and a relatively weak pawn on d6. You know, all these ideas become particularly manifest once these pawns on the e and f file get traded, as they allow all these pieces to come through. Of course, something essential in White's success is actually the massive preparation that he managed to create when he arranged his pieces in this optimal way. Now, going back, just one move. You know, in retrospect, maybe b6, as we were saying earlier, might have been an idea. But then White could still go for f4. If black decides to trade, then I can take with the knight and then play knight d3. You know, and this idea of e5 seems to be coming anyway. Maybe I'll play bishop f4 and then e5. It, it's a very strong idea. Now, another possibility is after f4, maybe you can just play bishop f6. And then here, the nice thing is that white can actually just try to build some pressure. I mean, we don't want to trade right away. Why would we let go of the tension move? We can just prepare further. So, for example, we could play king h2, rearrange my knight, go to f3, and now take. Now, if black were to take, then... And we manage this very successful pawn break, which actually just destroys black position entirely. So overall, I think in the last two games, we have seen some very successful execution of white's two main plans. There isn't really a lot more to tell you about this because white doesn't really have other plans and these plans are actually very powerful. But in the next video, I hope you will review it carefully because we will discuss how black could set up his pieces and set up his strategy so that he will be able to find good counterplay by means of pursuing this f7, f5 break earlier before things get ugly, like in this situation. So I'll see you in the next video.